Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome you back to Slinging the Biscuit. This is going to be episode 10, episode 10, episode 6, Dave, I did it again, episode 16 of the Slinging the Biscuit podcast, the new Slinging the Biscuit podcast. He was off on holidays last week. We called him back up. He used to rip up the streets of Main Street in downtown Winnipeg at the Earl's main location. They have moved locations, and so has Dave. Back to the podcast this week. My amazing co-host, Mr. Dave Wheeler. How are you, my friend? I missed you last week. Travis Ridgen, good to talk to you. Now, listen, I don't want to play jealous husband here at all, but uh, I, I checked out the pod over the weekend when it dropped uh, last week. And uh, listen, I, I I do not want to make this difficult on you, but if you want to go with the handsome, blonde-haired, tattooed-up, muscular 40-year-old who plays with knobs all day, is he single, by the way? Because I think my radio co-host might be interested. Uh, he has a he has a girlfriend, but he doesn't have a girlfriend. It, it's complicated. Okay, well, listen. Like, the, the fact that he plays with knobs all day might get my co-host all excited. Which one? <laughs> great question. <laughs> great question. But no, honestly, the uh, the pod is great. I'm glad you two got to uh, see each other. I mean, pandemic's been hard on everybody, so the fact that you guys got to reconnect after three years is uh, amazing. I'm so glad that he got to come into the locker room and just you know relive the glory days, even if it was for a moment or two. And that's uh, that's pretty cool. He told some pretty cool stories. I'm actually curious to know. Uh, because he played with the Marlies, I'm curious to know if he actually um, crossed paths with a buddy of mine uh, who I uh, who I played with named Colin Murphy uh, with the Toronto Marlies. So next time you talk to him, ask him if he played with Murph. I will absolutely have to uh, to ask him that. One one thing that Dave wanted me to mention is that because if you're new to the podcast, uh, Dave is a absolute Winnipeg Radio legend. He's been in the game for 20 years in the top morning show every morning in Winnipeg for the last 20 years. Myself, uh, I'm starting right bench for the Motor City Rockers in the Fed Zeno, or in the FPHL as we like to call it. And Dave has been trying to get me to, hey, make sure you introduce yourself because the podcast is growing. Uh, I think in the last uh, three, four months since we rebooted the podcast and rebranded it, the audience has uh, over tripled, which is is crazy. So uh, if you're a new listener, if you're on Apple, Spotify, if you're in the car, you're at the gym, you're making lunches for the kids, you're mopping the floors, whatever you're doing, Thank you for joining us. If you're on the YouTube video version, it's a privilege to be with you, and uh, we're excited to dive into today's That's podcast. That's the place to go is the YouTube, so you can go see Rob. Go check out the last episode. I mean, the guy's an absolute stud. Are you, are you kidding me? 40 years old? The guy looks like he could tear the antlers off a moose with his bare hands. <laughs> the crazy thing is, like, I've known him for seven years, and in the seven years, he hasn't aged. Like, he looks the same when I met him seven years ago to last week uh, when, when he left us. We recorded the podcast. It's crazy. Now, it's funny because uh, he was uh, sharing a few stories and relating his experiences with playing in the coast and playing in the American League and playing, uh, you know, you know, just kind of minor league hockey. And I, I, I never got a chance. Uh, for those that don't know, I, I, my career ended too early with an eye injury, but uh, I, I kind of lived on vicariously by working in hockey through coaching and uh, being the announcer for uh, a couple teams, including the American Hockey League's Manitoba Moose. And there was a, there's a story I got to share with you. I actually told half the story on my radio show uh, locally here in Winnipeg about Kevin Bieksa. And the reason why I brought it up is because he just got honored by the Vancouver Canucks uh, uh, Hockey Night in Canada. Uh, he's in the, he, but For those that don't get Hockey Night in Canada, it's basically our Saturday night broadcast. It's, uh, it's a tradition in Canada. They throw on Canadian teams. It's an absolute... It's a tradition. That's the best way I can describe it. And Ron McLean, who is a uh, you know, first ballot Hall of Famer, he, uh, he hosts it with a bunch of uh, revolving characters. And Kevin Bieksa has been on for a handful of years since he kind of officially, unofficially retired from the NHL. He's from Grimsby, Ontario. And he signed a one-day contract with the Vancouver Canucks. So that's the team that he was uh, drafted with. He ended up going on with the Ducks. And so when the Canucks and Ducks played against each other, they honored him for the night. And it was, it was really cool. It was really special. Now, I had a chance to uh, not only uh, work with Kevin uh, when I was the announcer for the Manitoba Moose. So we're going back probably about... 15, 16 years ago, and uh, Bieksa was a rookie. So we're going back to like 2003, maybe 2004, and I was just fresh to Winnipeg as well, and I was the uh, the in-house announcer for the for the Manitoba Moose. And because I'm the same age as this guy, you know, I, I, I knew a few of the guys just by proxy from playing uh, back in minor hockey and junior and whatnot that, I, I you know, I'd go out with the guys after games and whatnot, and we'd, we'd have a few pops. And Fedor Fedorov, for those that don't know, he's the younger brother of Sergei Fedorov, who is the uh, the Hall of Famer with the Detroit Red Wings, wore number 91, won a handful of Stanley Cups with the Wings. So he was the little brother of of Sergei. Now, keep in mind, in the American League, you're not making huge scratch, but Russian brothers, Sergei was feeding him a lot of money. He was feeding him a lot of money. So he had the nicest car, the nicest threads, always had money to throw around, and and he he acted like it. Like he, he, he just had this this bravado, this hubris around the locker room. And 
there was one of the it was one of the first few nights I was out with the uh, with the guys, and we were at. Funny you mentioned Mer, uh, Earl's off the top of the show. We were at Earl's Polo Park, uh, which is another Earl's location. Think of it like a. Uh, I'm trying to think of what would be, what would be the equivalent in the United States of an Earl's, like a upper, like not super high end, but like affordable, like middle class, like nice restaurant, good lounge, good drinks, good looking uh, servers on both sides. Like, what what, what would they the equivalent of that be? Maybe Coyote Joe's around here. Maybe, maybe like a Moxie's. I don't know if Moxie's is still around over here, but. Okay. All right. So something like that. So anyways, we're out after, and Fetter is just, he's had a few, he, he's, he's, he's ha- had a few moments in the locker room where he, you know, takes advantage of the rookies, and he decided to pick on Kevin Bieksa. He decided, he decided to p- uh, pick on, on Bieksa. So all night long, he's just like, rookie, go get me this. Rookie, go get me that. Rookie, you're going to do this. Rookie, you're going to do that. And he's on him all night long. And when the guys are saying that Fetter was just pestering him in the dressing room, like everything, rookie, go get my stick. Rookie, go grab me tape. Like he was just beating on Bieksa really bad. So towards the end of the night, Bieksa goes up to him. And, and Bieksa's good. I mean, like he's, he's playing the whole rookie role. And he's like, yeah, okay, all right. But you can tell he's getting agitated throughout the night. So I, I wasn't there to witness this, but the story goes that um, uh, Bieksa goes up to Fetter and goes, hey, Fetter, uh, let, me, uh, let me walk you to your car. Let me, let me make sure you get home okay. He's like, yeah, good, good, rookie. Now you're, you're starting to understand. Good for you, rookie. So he walks him out to the parking lot by himself and absolutely kicks the shit out of Fetter Fetter off. <laughs> 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 like I, I, I don't, I don't think he was laying the boots to him in the parking lot, but he made it very clear. Okay, I've had, I, I've had my fill. This is it. You bossed me around enough, and uh, threw him into his car and sent him home. And walked back in and had a few more drinks. But uh, yeah, Kevin Bieksa, if you ever watched him play, he was not a guy you wanted to mess with, and he made that very clear, uh, regardless of what team you played for, even if it was your own. I think the best part of that whole story is that, that he's he teamed him up as the night goes on. He's probably got it mapped out maybe twenty minutes before. I'm going to get him a little bit more lubricated. We're going to go right out to the parking lot. I'm going to help him, and then we're going to deal with the situation. Worked out to his advantage, and clearly, I mean. Absolutely. Yeah, I, 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 don't, think he, I don't think it was a Lamborghini, but it was like, it was like a high-end, like 100,000-plus vehicle that he was driving to and just gave him a bloody lip and a bloody nose and threw him in his car and said, get out of here. So God love Kevin BX. He hasn't changed it. He's a hell of a broadcaster, too. I'll give him full credit. There's, there, there's a fine line between somebody who's played the game before and has moved into broadcasting as an analyst and somebody who actually has really good control. And I'll be honest with you, man, doing stuff like this, like doing the podcast, getting behind the mic as often as you do, it serves you well for down the road. Which brings me into my next topic. I would like to point out that I was sitting in uh, in front of my TV on Saturday night, and on my YouTube algorithm, it pops up. It's like, hey, uh, the Motor City Rockers are, are playing. The game's just started. I'm like, oh, sweet. I pop on, warm up had just finished, and I hear the announcer. I I, I can't remember the play by play guy's name. I, it, it kills me that I don't. I apologize. What's his name? So our play by play guy's name is uh, Ben. So shout out to Ben. Ben. So Ben comes on, and he uh, you were the first one to come out. You came out before the rest of the guys. You came out to make sure you the, the gate was working. Make make sure oh the gate opens and closes. I'm good. So you go to the Eagles, and there's Travis Ridge coming out leading out the team here, the uh, Motor City Rockers on a on a Saturday night here in uh, Motor City. And a big shout out to uh, Travis, who is uh, does a podcast, and um, wanted to wanted me to mention that he wanted to call out the starting goaltender's girlfriend because all she does is watch is, is watch uh, the the the, the warm up and then she leaves. And I'm going, like, what like what is going on here? Like like we're we're chirping guys' girlfriends now through the play by play announcers. Uh, so to to back that up a little bit, this is actually a great story. I'm glad you mentioned it, Dave. So. Uh... The, the fellows, we line up to go on the ice, and, and one of the guys said, Trav, lead us out, lead us out. And I'm, I'm thinking, guys, I don't have my mask. I don't have my stick. I got my backups hat on. You know, I got, I'm just chewing bubble gum. I got like five pieces of double bubble. I'm ready to have a, you know, I'm ready to have a night for myself. And they say, lead us out. I said, okay. So I let us out, you know, full steam ahead as fast as one can go when you got one speed and it's slow. Uh, right to the door, set up. And I mentioned to Ben before the game, we, we, we talk, you know, I stretch kind of where... Uh, and warm up where like the broadcaster's booth is. And, you know, we chat, we catch up and whatnot. And I said, hey, you want to do me a favor? He's like, what's that, Trav? Anything, what do you need? And I said, can you give my girl a shout out? And he says, what do you mean? I said, well, she is the most loyal supporter, the most amazing woman. I got the most beautiful, amazing woman in the world. I say it every episode. I, I repeat myself again because it's true. But she literally tunes into the live stream games just for warm ups to watch me. She's having wine night with one of her friends. They watch the warm ups. Warm-ups are done. 
and then they bounce and they go and do whatever else they need to do because obviously you're not going to see me during the game. And uh, I told Ben to give her a little shout out, and uh, I guess Ben said, you know, I'll, I'll give her a little bit of a chirp. So uh, she obviously heard the the trip. She stayed a little bit past warm up. She heard that live as well, and uh, apparently the live chat for the game was was ripping her apart. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll be honest with you, I didn't stick around much more than uh, ten minutes into the first. I had to bounce myself. I had an event to go to, but I was uh, very happy that Ben uh, not only gave uh, the podcast a shout out, but actually mentioned my name. My name's officially part of the uh, federal league canon now, which I'm excited about. So Ben, thank you very much. I don't know if he listens to the pod or not, but. Uh, Heck of a play-by-play guy. I'll tell you, he's got the chops. Yeah, I, I did mention him. I said, you know, Wheels has been talking about replacing you. He says, who? When? What? I said, oh, uh, my podcast, Sling on the Biscuit, my co-host, Dave Wheeler. Ever heard of him? No, I never heard of him. Well, he's going to take your job. And he says, oh, really? I said, well, he's he's been kind of putting in the works. We're trying to get him down here. Can't come down for some reason. We don't know why. But uh, when the opportunity presents itself and the iron's hot, he's going to come and replace you. So you better stay hot. You better stay sharp because Dave's going to be the new play-by-play voice for the Motor City Rockers. I will say, a couple of the boys did mention, what's it going to take to get uh, Dave to come down here and do some play-by-play? I'll leave it at that. I'll well, that. L- listen, you go talk to old sleepy Joe Biden and let him know I want to come into the country and give him, uh, as, as, if, I, if I can get a, um, a, a veto or something or a, a special pass because as it stands right now, I am not allowed into that beautiful country. <laughs> Uh, I'm I'm great at Photoshop. If I mentioned that, anyway, we should probably move on. But uh, uh, we do have some exciting news that uh, I wanted to share with with you live, Dave, and then obviously the, the people listening to the podcast. This is always going to be the headliner for the week. But um, uh, it, it's it's been a little bit of a challenging month or so in Motor City. Obviously, if you're if you're listening to this live, hopefully, I mean not hopefully, but it probably hasn't changed. Maybe it has changed by the time this goes up after the weekend games. But um, I haven't gotten a single start all season. We're about a, mm, five weeks, but a month and a bit into the season and. No starts. I got put in uh, after a line brawl, and we ended up winning, which is great. Uh, but I haven't had a start yet, and uh, people are asking, "When are you going to start? When are you going to start?" Well, I'm I'm starting right bench. I got to you know I'm playing the role, right? I'm I'm the team guy. I'm the glue guy. I got to support guys. I got to hype guys up, make everybody feel good, get get everybody ready to go. If our starter needs anything, I'm the guy to help. You need waters on the bench, bench, fresh hot towels, whatever you need. I got it. And uh, you know, I talk, talking to coach today. Coach calls me and he says, "Hey, I just want to let you know, uh, you're going to get a start this month." I said, oh, great. Who am I playing? And he says, uh, I don't know yet. I was like, well, well what am I going to start? He's like, well, we're going to figure that out. We're, we're trying to figure out, um, we're trying to see how the, how the team uh, behaves in front of different goalies in practice, obviously, because, and Rob alluded to it last week, is that whether you want to believe it or not, players do play differently in front of different goaltenders. And if you're like the guy who's, you know, chirping Rob at every opportunity, Rob is not going to want to defend you. If you're the guy that's you know endearing yourself to your defenseman. They'll you know they'll go fight a guy. They snow you, all that kind of stuff. So, uh, coach is looking for that kind of stuff to figure out. I guess what game I'm gonna, I'm going to get, um, it, which is great. My job is to prepare. I'm trying my best, watching every single game when Babs does play, and and for the 44 minutes that I've played this season, is trying to like look at what's happening in the game and then recreate that in practice and build off that. And I do generally believe that, like, there is a game plan behind not playing a lot. Is that, like, I, I watch every game. I see, and I'm, I'm trying to observe critically, like, what is going on. And I see these these themes over the game. Granted, we've only played two teams so far in eight games. But, uh, like, two different teams in eight games. But I'm trying to observe these things, like, make changes to my game. And I think it is going to benefit me waiting longer to get a start. Well, let's give a shout-out to the fact that you guys are first in your division right now. I mean, I know you uh, the, the Columbus has some games in hand, but you guys are sitting at 5-2. and two. Uh, which is awesome, 15 points. Columbus has two games in hand. They're one point behind you right now. So, I mean, I, I totally understand from a coach's perspective, uh, riding the hot goaltender when you can. But, uh, you know, there's uh, nothing like throwing a, uh, a little messed up uh, starting lineup card at your opposition, especially if you're playing the same teams, and throw them a different look. It's not a bad thing. Absolutely. And I was saying to, uh, to Babs, our starter today, because he's been incredible. He's making 40, 45 saves every game, keeping us in games. And when a guy's playing that good, like you, you can't argue the fact that he's the best goaltender in the league, in my opinion. You show me any goalie in the Fedzino, and you tell me that they're better than Babs, I will show you a liar. Like It's just simple and, and straight cut like that, Dave. And I was telling Babs today, I was like, dude, I, I love you. I'm here to support you. But God, I, I hope every goalie in the SP blows a knee out this month or this week. I hope they tear a gra- I hope something terrible happens to every SP goalie because when that happens, you go up and you don't come back anytime soon because they're done, and then everything's good here. Then I can finally start playing some more games. But obviously, 
Uh, Bab's going to be here for a while, unless that changes. So, and he's the guy, and I got to support him. Well, let me ask you this question because you had mentioned it in your in your vlog at uh, Trav Four, uh, the most recent episode, uh, the one last week, and you said that there's major differences. Uh, differences. I won't say major. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you said there's differences between the European game and and the North American game, and I can understand that as a defenseman when it comes to uh, bigger ice. You know, wider areas, a lot more room behind the net. But from a goaltender's perspective, I'm curious to know what are those differences because you really didn't go into it much. Yeah, so I'll tell them the podcast because obviously less people listen to the podcast than watch the vlog. Hopefully that, <laughs> I mean, I mean, hopefully that does the change. People are here for the details, <laughs> and that's why we're going to share it on the podcast. Um, I, and um, just to be clear, one of the reasons why I don't want to put it on the vlog is that like the vlog is, is in all reality very hot right now. It was like 40, 50 plus thousand people, almost 60,000 people watching every episode. And I know for a fact, most of the league is watching and I don't want to start giving away my, you know, my secrets in my tool book. So that when I do get a start, they're going to study it. And then I, I, you know, I bend myself over if that makes sense. I don't want to be caught my pants down. So I will tell it to you on the podcast because I don't know if everybody in the league listens to it, but we'll find out. Um, so playing two years in Sweden, the biggest difference obviously at face value is that the rink is bigger. It's a 200 by a hundred foot rink compared to North America. It's 200 by 85 feet. So you got about 15 feet, give or take, of extra real estate. And it may not seem like a lot, but... Well, no, I don't listen, as a defenseman, I mean, that's a lot more room for a guy to curl around you. There's a lot more room for a, a forward to come get you behind the net. As a forward, there's a lot more room to set up on the half wall. There's a lot more room between the blue line and the goal line. So again, as 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 a player, I can understand the difference, but I'm trying, I'm trying to decipher it for a goaltender. Yeah, so I think that the game happens a little bit slower in, in Europe, just because guys have more time, guys can be more patient. So I have the ability to find the perfect setup on on a more consistent basis for a shot, as opposed to here, where guys will fire it at any moment in time. They give you no trigger warning. They just pump it, whether you're ready or not. And pucks find holes. You know, you know, pucks like water. If there's a hole, it will find it one way or another. And like guys crash the net, they're looking for re- rebounds, and you combine that with the fact that they are firing anything and everything at any moment. It makes life a little bit chaotic, and I've been trying to just focus on having my feet ready at a moment's notice where I can just, I can start the engine, and I can go 0 to 100, left, right, you know, whatever combination I need to do. Problem with that is, as I mentioned earlier, is I have one speed, and it's slow, so try getting, try getting a, you know, a big rig semi-trailer, or, you know, a, a tractor trailer in gear, it takes a little while, so, you know, I'm not like our starting goaltender who... It's like I'm Ra- Maserati. That guy goes zero to a hundred and he doesn't stop. He just like he it's incredible to watch him every single day. And I think that's rubbing off me a little bit and trying to like get me a little bit faster, which I appreciate. But I think that's a big thing. I think guys are, I think guys are just more skilled over here compared to Sweden did Division three at first. I didn't see it, and like now as time is going on and guys from the SP are getting released and they're coming down and teams are getting better. Uh, like our team is better right now than we were day one, and it's way better than in training camp. And I'm sure every team in the league is. It's challenging me every single day. And so those are the kind of changes that I'm looking to make is just like closing down on pucks, getting on top of pucks, having my feet ready at a moment's notice because they will piss pump me. Like guys love, uh, I've noticed in practice and even in games too, guys love a uh, piss pump or five hole with no trigger warning. And, and it catches guys, it catches me sometimes too. So I'm trying to figure those out and trying to get that like 100% because that's, that's a no-no that can't happen in games. Um, I think that's, Probably the, the major differences. It's it's funny you say that because I would have thought that over in Europe, it just in my experience, there the skill level when it comes to shooting, to me seems to be a little more accurate. Hmm. Uh, you know, part of the problem with 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 like breaking that down is like it's been um, about nine months since I've been over in Sweden since like my last game. So like, like trying to remember what it's like compared to now where like this is all I focus on is kind of tough. I, I like to think that maybe the, the accuracy is a little bit better in Sweden, but like guys are skilled here too. Like most of the goals that beat me in practice, like guys are going post in, they're going cross barn in, they're, they're making like the one play they have left that would beat me and, and they find a way to make that play. So well, it's funny you said, and just and just going back to last week's podcast when Rob talked about how guys are interchangeable from you know from the East Coast to the to the AHL to the SP and into the Fed, I, I don't disagree with him. One of the biggest things I noticed when I was working in the American Hockey League, um, your your first and second line are interchangeable with your fourth, third, and even second line sometimes in the NHL. The biggest difference for me between the NHL and the minor leagues is that you don't have 
you don't always have a standout superstar on your team. Like you don't have a guy that can put the team on his shoulders and take over. And number two, the passing. There is there are very 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 few missed passes in the National Hockey League where you'll see guys will get it in the vicinity of players, but it's not right on the tape. And that's one of the biggest differences. We were, we were actually talking about that today at practice and the fact that like as you go up the ranks, the hockey gets cleaner because, like you said, guys are so skilled. Everything is 100%. It's pristine. And as a goaltender, I would like to think that it makes life a little bit easier because it's more predictable. It's a little bit more controlled. right? They, the whole environment altogether is all more controlled when compared to the Fed, you know, the SP, and as you, you know, climb down the ranks, shall we say, things are a little bit more broken. Like I said, guys will fire anything at any moment's time, and you have to be ready for that. Life gets easier as you go up, but the reality is like I'm not going up anytime soon. I've only played 44 minutes, so I'm, I'm trying to accommodate the game right here, right now. And I've noticed that playing a little bit deeper, well, actually playing significantly deeper in my crease, although guys look at it and ask me, like, why are you doing this? This doesn't make any sense. Well, I'm the biggest goaltender in the league, so if I just if I sit in the goal line or if I stand on the goal line and I just focus on like a pivot, so I'm playing on like a triangle, if that makes sense. Is that a fact? Post- are, you act- are you actually the tallest goaltender in the Fed? Yeah, nobody is 6'5". I, I looked the other day, nobody's 6'5". So uh, unless somebody got uh, you know dropped down and sent down recently, I'm the biggest goaltender in the Fed, and I'm playing a system that is post, 50 crease, back to post. It, it's very deep and maybe a little bit shallow for some guys liking, but it allows me to be in position more often than what other guy or what I would be if I was playing more aggressive. Granted, I would take up more of the net, but I believe... In my ability to read plays and read shots, I th- I think, in my biased opinion, I'm very, very good at reading releases when I'm set and when I'm in position. But the problem is, how do I get there? Well, I get there by playing a little bit deeper. Um, and, and we're going to find out when I get that first start if it's actually going to work or not. Well, keep me in the loop because I'll make sure I'm on the YouTube that day. So as soon as you get the green light, I am I am glued to my YouTube channel. And, and speaking of taking care of your crease, I think this is a good opportunity to transition into... Movember and why guys should be taking care of their crease. Yes. Well, actually, uh, so our first ad is the presenting sponsor for this podcast, the amazing team at Sheath Underwear. And I got a story that is going to bring it all home for you. So we were playing uh, Saturday night at home against Port Huron. And one of our vets, our grizzled vets, we call him Z. I don't actually know his real name. His, we just call him Z, like the letter Z, that's it. And Z is a, is a big uh, lumberjack looking guy, very tough guy. right? And Z was a healthy scratch on Saturday. He's walking in the room. And I couldn't help but notice something in his pants swaying from side to side. And I said, Z, I got to be honest with you. You got to have the absolute biggest hammer I've ever seen. Like, like, what is going on? And he's like, well, it's actually the pants. And I said, you know what? I think you'd be the perfect candidate for a pair of sheath underwear. And I'll tell you why. So Z told me he has a very large basket, if you understand what I'm saying. Because we got to keep it PG because sometimes there might be some family members, right? You know what I'm saying? So he has a large basket. He has a large basket. And I said, well, the, the team at Sheath Underwear have pioneered the dual pouch, which is a pouch that segregates your basket from your twig, shall we say. So everything has its own compartment. So the twig goes into a pouch. The basket goes into a separate pouch. And it is not touching the sides of your leg. It cannot stick. It cannot sweat. It doesn't get as musky. And it is amazing. It is comfortable. The bamboo mesh materials on the Sheath Underwear are second to none. And you ask Z, I'm going to get him a pair tomorrow. He's going to love it. Big Sexy, if you've seen Big Sexy in the vlog, that what an absolute man missile, um, a meat mallet that man has on him. And he's loving his sheath underwear. Dave has been rocking sheath underwear for a while, loves it. And Rob is a recent converter as well. And myself, I've been rocking sheath for about two years, and it is the only way to go. And if you're listening on the video podcast on YouTube, or if you're in the car, you got to go to sheathunderwear.com. You're going to use the promo code BISCUIT69. That's going to be B I Z. KIT69, you can't forget it. Biscuit69 is going to get you 20% off the best on where money can buy. Also, the fact that like sheath is cheaper than the competitors. I looked on online recently. That'll last you like years. Like the stuff I'm wearing today, like right now at this moment in time, I can't take my pants off, obviously, for, for reasons I can't explain to you. I will. On the podcast. <laughs> Dave will rip them off for you. But uh, it's the same pair of underwear that I got uh, in my demo package two years ago when I started working with Sheath. So uh, Sheath is built to last. It is the best in the business. Code Biscuit69, 20% off. And if you're a lady that got bralettes, my girl loves hers. Doesn't even know that she's wearing it when she's going out and about wearing it. It's fantastic. It, and it looks so hot. Dave, you know. Dave, uh, did, we got to get a pair for Candace in the red bralette. But uh, what a what a look. Well, and, and just to circle back to Movember, which is, uh, for those that don't know, it is a charity that's been going on for uh, about 15 years now, and it uh, focuses on men's health, which is something a lot of times that uh, men are just told to, oh, don't talk about your problems, no, no, just shove it down and you know, compress that and blah. Um, one of the biggest things about 
health in general is prevention. You know, before before you even get to that stage is is prevention, and that's taking care of yourself, whether that be through working out or vitamins or mental health or whatever it may be. But if we're talking specifically about the uh, the nether regions, making sure you take care of your boys is 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 issue number one. I mean, we're 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 beyond the days of like here's a piece of cloth to put between your junk and your jeans. They're called boxers. You know, they'll, they'll work out great. We're at a point now where we're a little more conscious about how to take care of ourselves and how to be healthy. And I think getting a pair of underwear that is comfortable, where you're not constricted, where you can be a little more free and not have to worry about that kind of stuff. I think that's that is a, that is an extremely good investment for for anybody, regardless of what age you are. Yeah, I don't know how I'm allowed to tell the story. Obviously, if you're new to the podcast, I live at uh, Goalie Coach Bill's guest house, and uh, Bill's selling the house. I got to be out next week sometime, but he was he was building this like um, this like railing uh, on the upstairs like suite of the place. And Bill was working hard the other day, you know, drill bits, you know, he's an absolute tool, man. He's going to work, he's putting in that time. And I came home from practice and I could smell the fact that he needed sheath underwear. Like Bill was sweating, Bill was working hard. I was like, oh God, you need some sheath. <laughs> Jesus Christ. That so is Bill, a, Bill is also That is a the pungent list smell. <laughs> that is the smell of hard work, but you can work hard and be comfortable too with the, uh, with the amazing team of sheath underwear. Uh, speaking of working hard, one one thing that I, I wanted to share with Dave and, and everybody in the podcast is this is an amazing story. Uh, so if you're watching the vlog, obviously, uh, if you're new to the podcast, I, I got to get into a habit of explaining this because there are people that listen to the podcast every week that tell me, I've never seen your vlogs. The podcast is great, but I don't know that you do a vlog. So I got to start explaining this stuff. Uh, so I do a vlog called Life in the Fed, documenting my journeys through you know the FPHL, my team, all this kind of stuff. And one of the guys in our team, he's our designated fighter. Uh, his name is Elias Thompson. I call him Big Sexy. And from the moment... When I called him Big Sexy for the first time, all the guys have started calling him Big Sexy. Like, like there is no Elias Thompson. That's not a, a thing anymore. He is Big Sexy. He had yeah. a good tilt. He had a good tilt at the end of last week's game, by the way. Yes, yes. There, he, he's had a couple fights. I think he was telling me today he's got three fights in the season. He says, I'm looking for five after this weekend. So he's a man on a mission. Um, Fantastic-looking man. Uh, built like a brick shit. I was 300 pounds. Muscle, do deadlifts, deadlifts, 750 pounds. I'm, he's probably listening right now. I'm stroking his ear. Yeah, yeah, that's not a dude you want to fight. Anyway, uh, so Big Sexy, uh, believe it or not, makes less money than I do. So I make 125 US a week playing in the Fed, 1785 a day. Big Sexy makes $110 a week. So easy making even less than me, which I didn't know that, that was a thing. I thought the league minimum was 125 Apparently, it's 110 And uh, so on the side, uh, he collects cans for like recycling. So like after every home game, he will go to the main concourse and go around the arena and go through all the recycling cans and or the bins and all the garbage bins and pull out all the empty cans like beer cans soda cans you name it he'll have a garbage bag and he'll like fill it with cans everywhere in the locker no i'm not kidding you Dave. this is what he does after every game he does a like a walk around so most guys do like a puck walk after practice they pick up pucks that went in the stands no he does a puck walk but he does like cans still man some some guys cut podcasts, some guys are sandwich artists, and some guys are can collectors. Whatever it takes to keep playing as long as you can, God love you. It, it, it's absolutely hilarious. I mean, I absolutely respect the hustle, the fact that he's going out of his way to find these cans, bring them into the vendor and get, you know, five, ten cents for cans. He gets himself 25 bucks a day, but boom, now he's making 135 a day. He's making more than I am, and he's got some extra grocery money. So I, I absolutely respect the hustle. We actually did a segment uh, which will be on, uh, if you're listening to the podcast now, it's probably up for Sunday's vlog, but it's called Big Sexy Side Hustle. And he kind of breaks down like how he does the whole cam operation. It's hilarious. And uh, I've, I've been telling Victoria about this for a couple weeks. And she texted me today. She's like, is Big Sexy in Vancouver by chance? I says, uh, no, I just left the rink and he was there. Why? She says, well, I was just at work and I saw a man biking by down the street with a garbage bag full of cans. And I thought that was him. <laughs> <laughs> Well, those, uh, from what I understand down East Hastings in Vancouver, those guys are a dime a dozen these days. <laughs> well, listen, man, everyone needs a side hustle these days. I mean, I, I don't want to get too much into the politics of things, but inflation's through the roof. I mean, regardless of what side of the border you're on, uh, everyone's paying a little extra. People are making cuts. I'll be honest with you. Even here in Winnipeg, uh, with the with the Winnipeg Jets, we had back-to-back -back games against the original six teams, the Montreal Canadiens and the Chicago Blackhawks, and neither game was sold out. And we got the smallest barn outside of uh, Phoenix, Arizona, we got the smallest barn in the league, and uh, they couldn't fill a uh, 15 and change. Really, I, I noticed that last year too. Though, when uh, when I went to the Flyers game, like right at the end of the season when I came back from Sweden, um, tickets were I want to say 65, 70 bucks. Bought them last minute on Ticketmaster Exchange, and I would say maybe 
60 percent full like it was really empty like i was able to walk down no problem from the upper deck right down to the front row not a problem no security no nothing so yeah I th- I've, I've noticed that as well there's not as many sellouts especially like in winnipeg of all places well listen if you got to decide between going to see your favorite hockey team or putting food on your table i think uh i think the hockey team's going to be a close second well i have been absolutely eaten alive with fines from the guys from from team court you know what team court is right yeah Dave? yeah we mentioned this on the podcast a few weeks ago yeah so i've been telling the fellas this is boys this Canada U.S. dollar is absolutely just crucifying me. Like, I feel like Jesus Christ out there. Like, this, like, uh, 65 or 70 cents on the dollars eat me alive. we got to take it easy on the fines because like, they are pinning me to it. Uh, and But I will be honest, I got a fine the other day, and I absolutely deserve this. I'm, I'm curious what you think about this, Dave. So, obviously, by definition, I'm a rookie in the league, right? So, I, I don't have much um But you play pro hockey. Like, you're a rookie in the league, but you're not, like, a rookie by rookie standards. Are you? Are you? Uh, we, we have a, like a hockey board in the room and on the bottom it says rookies and my name is on the list. So I think they beg to differ. <laughs> Interesting because uh, there, there's the old story about it of Genny Malkin and, and Sidney Crosby. They had a little battle about who goes onto the ice last when they, when they take to the ice and, uh, Sidney Crosby goes, well, you know, we're both rookies. And he goes, no, 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 two league, two years, super league Russia. And so that gave him, so that's why Evgeny Malkin goes on the ice last for the Pittsburgh Penguins. And Sidney Crosby goes on the ice second last. So you do have pro experience. So I don't think, I don't, I, for me, I don't think you should be on the rookie board. I'm, I'm curious. Let, to the people listening on the YouTube version, leave a comment down below if you are on the Apple Spotify version. Leave me a, a direct message on Instagram. I'd like to hear from you. I don't think our team cares. Uh, I think our team is, is loving the fact that I'm happy to pack the bus when uh, we go on a road trip this weekend to New York. I'll, I'll pack the... Uh, Pack the team bags up there. I do that myself if I have to. I, uh, yeah, I do all the, the rookie stuff when, when asked, and it's not a problem. But um, w- when we were on the road in Watertown uh, two weeks ago, uh, when I was scratched the one game, one of, one of our vets, Colts, shout out to him, he says, Trav, uh, I'm going to need three hot dogs for the end of the game. And I said, why? He's like, I, like to, I have three hot dogs after every single game. And I was like, well, you don't need hot dogs. No, 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 Trav, go get me some hot dogs. I was like, well, I don't want to get you hot dogs. He says, why? I said, well, the lineup's at the door, and I don't want to stand in the lineup. And one of the guys backed me up. He was scratched as well. He's like, yeah, dude, the lineup's insane. He's like, Trav, I need hot dogs. Get me three hot dogs after the game. Here's some money. And he gives me some cash. He says, okay, not a problem. I'll go down there. I'll go do it. So I go to the lineup. I waste about, well, maybe not waste. I use up about 15 minutes waiting in line. Finally get to the front line. Hi, yep, can I get uh, three hot dogs and a chicken finger for myself? And she says, sir... We just sold the last hot dog. I was like, no, damn it. All right, well, I'll get a uh, chicken finger, please, uh, three piece. And she says, um, our debit machine just went down. Do you have cash? And I looked down at my, my hand and I said, yes, I do. <laughs> so I gave, her, I gave her the cash the Colts gave me, got myself a little combo. And I thought in my head, he said, hot dogs. I don't know if he's a chicken strip kind of guy. I don't, I'm just going to bring him back the cash and tell him, hey, I owe you five. So after the game, obviously... There's a you know empty can of chicken strips in the in the garbage, and then there's 15 bucks instead of 20 on uh, you know Colts' stall. And he says, "Trev, why do I only have 15?" I said, "Oh, I bought myself a, a, five, a three-piece chicken strip combo." And he's like, "I'm gonna max find the shit out of you. You can't do that." I said, "Why?" He's like, "You, I gave you money to get me hot dogs. You didn't get me the hot dogs, and then you used my money to buy yourself chicken strips. That's a five-dollar max fine." I said, "Well, they were out of hot dogs. The debit machine went out." I did what I had to do, and I was hungry. And he's like, nope, I'm going to absolutely stick it to you. So he finds me for 5 bucks. I thought I was in the right because of the variables that I mentioned. I'm, I'm curious again on the YouTube version what people think. And um, we ended up coming to a truce this week. We had to make an arrangement because he was going to ding the shit out of me for fines again. But me, I've been watching him. I saw him take a tumble in warm-ups the other day, and I said, I, I got some stuff on you, buddy. Don't you worry. I'll bring some stuff to court. Don't you worry. So we shook on it. We made a truce, and I probably saved myself a lot of money. So... I don't know. Make, um, if, if this guy had a Russian accent, I'd say he may need to walk out to his vehicle. <laughs> hey, Colts, let me walk you out to your vehicle after yeah. practice. Make let sure you go. get home safe, buddy. Let me get you a few hot dogs. I'll walk you out to your vehicle. <laughs> See how that goes. Yeah, assuming that they're not out. Listen, I, uh, I, I get the whole rookie thing. I think there is a... Um, there is a period that where rookies need to be rookies, but after that is said and done, then it needs to move on. I, 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 I think we're almost past that in this day and age, are we not? Yeah, the, the hockey culture is... I mean, it's evident with, with the Mitch Miller thing. Like The hockey culture is, 
is in the shitter. It, it, I think it has been for a while. A lot of people say that I'm out of touch and I'm delusional. I beg to differ. Like I'm, I'm still in the game. I'm actively in the game. I see it every day. Like we, we talk about it in the locker room. We, you know, a bunch of the guys and myself. We were talking about that today. Or the Mitch Miller situation. We're all like, this okay, is well, the problem. We'll, we'll fill everyone in because if people are going, who, who, who the heck is Mitch Miller? Does, does he play for the uh, for the Rockers? No. Like I, I tell everyone. Praise the Lord, he does not play for the Rockers. I could only imagine what kind of guy this would be. Anyway, um, this is probably going to be one of the last stories we top off the, or we, we finish off with the podcast. And just a little bit of a trigger warning. There may be some you know sensitive things we talk about in this little story. So if you've got sensitive ears, maybe uh, maybe go watch the vlog or maybe skip ahead, I don't know, like 10 minutes or so. Anyway, uh, so Mitch Miller, uh, and I, I hope I get all my facts right because there's a lot of information here. But so Mitch Miller was playing for the Tri-City Storm and the USHL and the U Show. Uh, ends up getting drafted to the Arizona Coyotes, fourth round in 2020, committed to the University of North Dakota at NODAC. Ends up being a story coming out that when he was 14 years old, uh, he bullied a, I believe, a mentally disabled black kid or a special needs black kid. Had some choice words, as you can imagine. And uh, I believe the mother came forward with that story and said, hey, this happened, never had an apology, was never reprimanded, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so the story comes out. Uh, University of North Dakota decommits him. And then the uh, Arizona Coyotes undrafted him. I can't remember the terminology for it, but they, they basically got rid of his rights. And then NCAA said, hey, yeah, you got to sit out a year. So fast forward, he sits out the 2020-2021 uh, year, no team to play for. Goes back this year to Tri-City, or last year went to Tri-City in the U show. Uh, won league MVP by a landslide. I believe he put up like 80, might have been 90 points in 60 or 50 games. Absolute stud year, especially as a defenseman, like over a point and a half, almost two points a game. Like that's a good year. Um, and then he ends up getting signed by the Boston Bruins uh, a couple days ago. And the Bruins come out, hey, we signed him. Bettman says, actually, we've changed our, our mind. Uh, he's not actually allowed to sign a contract. He's not eligible. I didn't know that was a thing, that you weren't eligible to sign an NHL contract. I mean, you have guys like Antonio Brown doing the things that they do. They can play. You have dudes... Uh, beating their wives you have dudes that, that are doing all these ridiculous things that have played in the game and then this guy isn't allowed to sign a contract now I want to be very clear I'm not defending the situation I'm just stating that it's a very uh, mixed message across the board as far as like what is and what isn't eligible like to, to play in the league and it just seems like hey if if the production outweighs the problems we'll take you but I, I would I would tip my hat to you know Bettman and the Bruins I, I don't know maybe the Bruins I don't think the Bruins really wanted to go along with this but they had to uh, but for the people that are, that are saying like, hey, like this is wrong. This is this is a step in the right direction to fix the hockey culture. This entitlement, this level of, I can do whatever I want because I have status in the hockey community, which like I've seen from starting hockey at four years old. Obviously, four year olds aren't you know having a lot of that, but up to now at twenty six, where I, I see it, like, it is alive and it is well in hockey culture. And people say to bring it back that I'm out of touch. Hockey doesn't have any problems. Well, if you don't think hockey has the problems, you are a part of the problem. There is a lack of respect in, in the world of, of hockey players. There's a level of entitlement that because you play hockey, that you have, you're have you entitled to some special status that, girl, that women are supposed to embrace you as holier than thou. When the real truth is you play hockey, you cut that aside, you have nothing. What kind of a perfect person are you? Are you a shit individual? Uh, I mean, I heard a story. You know, I'm going to say it anyway because, you know, whatever. I heard a story from you know one of the guys that I skated with over the summer that, you know, Mitch Miller... No, this is not confirmed. This is just what I was told at a summer skate. So they I don't are want to allegations. Like, they are they are rumored allegations. Allegations. So this is not the holy gospel. But I was told from a player on a team that may or may not have had Mitch Miller, wink, 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 that there's three sexual assault cases in the last year. Now, at the moment when I was told the story, it didn't click in. I thought, oh, okay, carried on with my day. And then a couple weeks later when the Mitch Miller stuff started resurfacing, I thought, Oh, I probably should have asked more questions at the time. So he told me three cases in the last year. Now, I don't know if that was a calendar year. Is that a 12-month year? Is that a season year? I, I didn't clarify that information. I really wish I did. But you look at the fact that you have these three charges, apparently, that the, the team that he played for paid off, said, hey, here's some money. Go away. Just beat it. We don't want to deal with this problem anymore. You have the bullying of this 14-year-old you know, special needs kid. And then the fact that, like, like, let's just be honest and realistic for a second. In today's day and age, all this guy has to do is make a fake apology. He doesn't have to mean it. Like you can only imagine how many fake apologies have been Real made. Real apology the would be nice. It would be nice, but considering his track record, you can't tell me the apology is going to be sincere. So let's just chalk it up to you. He just makes a fake apology and just, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do this. He doesn't mean it. That's all he has to do, and he won't even do that. He will not admit the fact that it happened. I made a mistake. 
uh, he, he put some stuff up publicly, apparently like lukewarm two or three years ago, but he hasn't actually apologized to the people that he's done it to. And he will not put out a public apology in regards to this circumstances. So this right here is the prime example. Of what I talk about when I say like, as somebody involved in hockey and that plays the game every day for a living, hockey culture is a problem. And it is why I honestly would never put my kid into hockey unless he absolutely wanted it. If he said, dad, assuming when I have a kid, dad, I want to play hockey. I want it. I want to be good. I want to be great. Well, what am I going to say? I can't say no. That would be the one situation where I say, yeah, okay, let's do hockey. But well, okay, Dave, listen, Dave I'm, you are dead. I am I am going to play devil's advocate here. I am not saying that I am supporting uh, Mitch Mitch Miller, and I just want to go back and, and uh, give you some, some stats on him. Last year, he played 60 games in the USHL, as you said, with the Tri-City Storm, put up 83 points, 39 goals, 44 assists and uh, was a plus 43 on the season. I mean, those are incredible numbers. He's a smaller defenseman. He's 5'10 at 190 pounds, but he's a, he's a solid dude. Okay, so, so his stats are there, all right? Like, so he, see, he seems like he's a bit of a blue chipper. Like, I, I would almost kind of say like maybe a Josh Morrissey with a little more scor- scoring prowess, okay? Now, when a team, and this is the way it's been forever, when a team is looking at how are they going to shape their, their, their hockey team, they're not looking at if this guy is going to win the Lady Bing or not. That's not what they're looking at. They're not looking to see what this guy's uh, volunteer status is at the local food bank. They're not looking at, you know, they're not they're not setting up cameras in his home to say, you know, does he does he clean his room and then how does he treat his mother? They're looking at how do they improve their blue line. And I think it has to be on the team. I don't think the league can start dictating whether or not they decide on moral fiber who gets to play in the league and who doesn't. I mean, he was a child and when I say child, I mean under the age of 18 when these things happened, we expunge records when, when people turn 18 saying that happened as a youth. You have a fresh start on life. Hopefully you've learned your lessons, but we'll be keeping a close eye on you. You can move forward. Now, I, I think for the league to say you're not allowed to play when the team, the Boston Bruins, have already said, this guy's got talent. We want to put him in the lineup and the league steps in. I think that's a little bit of overstep. I really do because it's not like there's a lot of guys in the leagues right now that are completely innocent of anything that they've done as an adult. So I'm not defending, and I am not in a single nuance defending any of his actions that he's done in the past, but I think we have to allow for a certain level of forgiveness. Sure, I understand what you're saying, that you know, you're basically just graduating him to do more bad behavior, but I think the kid at least deserves a chance. And, and I agree. I agree with every point you, you made right there. I'm a firm believer in second chances. To be honest, I'm a believer in, to an extent, third chances. But when, when every action the guy has done along the way lines up with, with the character, and, and this is what we're talking about—the character of the guy—it's it, hard to look the other way. You know what I mean? So I don't know, Mitch. If you're listening, just have some accountability, dog. That's all it takes in this world. I'm a firm believer. You can make any mistake in this world. And, and a genuine, sincere apology and responsibility, accepting responsibility, I, I think will will make up for it. That's how my old man raised me, and, and I think that that is the solution to, to you know, most problems in this world. But I don't know. I don't know, Dave. You're, you're a dad. What, what do you think? Like, you got two boys. I know that they're not in hockey, but like, like, what's what, what's your two cents on this? When it, when it comes to playing hockey, well, I uh, I mean, like having mind, your kids, like having your kids come into the hockey culture. I love hockey. I I, I grew up on hockey. That that was my culture, and. Um, as, as awful as some of the things were that I grew up with, I think it is moving in the right direction. I actually recently had a conversation with a friend of mine. We were arguing about the whole Live Golf uh, PGA thing. And I said, well, I said, well, you got to pull your kid out of hockey just because of what's going on with Hockey Canada? He goes, as a matter of fact, I did. He goes, it actually, it absolutely blew me away that the league fees that we pay for minor hockey, a percentage of that goes towards Hockey Canada. And some of that money goes towards that fund that was covering up a lot of the bad stuff that went on. And I talked to my son about it. And I said, how important is hockey to you? And he said, well, I just kind of played hockey because I thought you wanted me to play hockey. And he goes, I wanted you to learn the game and enjoy the game. But if you are at a point where it, it, you're not enjoying it, you don't have to play. So he's now going into refereeing. And, 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 I, and I appreciate that moral stance. I really do. As far as my kids, they didn't show the passion. They enjoy the game, but they didn't say, Dad, I really want to play. I take them skating every Saturday. I think it's important as a Canadian or an American or anybody. You learn how to skate. I think it's a fun thing to do and something you can do later in life. You can do throughout your life. But... My, my, my boys didn't show a passion for it. They love jiu-jitsu. They love golf. They love sports. They, they just didn't. And I'm not going to force them into it. I'm not, I'm not going to live vicariously through my children. Agreed. Uh, you know, I was telling Victoria this the other night. Like she was asking, not to like, change, change this up too much, but you know, her and I were talking about like, the future of us together and like, 
realistically speaking, as a woman who, I mean, most women want this, a woman who wants to settle down eventually, like have a kid, get married, you know, the, the whole shebang. She says, hey, let's let's be honest for a sec. How long do you want to play hockey for, right? Like, like she's like, I don't want another Tom Brady where you're like 45 years old and we got unfinished business. Like, Tom, you, you have no unfinished business. You're the biggest winner in the history of winners. Nothing's unfinished. But anyway, so I said to her, I said, you know, I love hockey and I love goaltending. Like that, that is my absolute passion in, in this world. I love film. I love flying my drone. I love doing this podcast every single week with you, Dave. But like, you know, one of my core hobbies ever since I was four years old is playing hockey and stopping pucks. <clears throat> As I've gotten older, the business side of hockey, the, the, I, I don't want to use the word politics because I think when people say politics and hockey, it's like, um, uh, a, like a, a victim word. Like, oh, I was hard done by, by politics. That's not the case. The business side of hockey that you are, as Rob said last week, you're meat on a hook, bro. You're literally a meat stick on a hook. You're an asset. That's all you really are. That part of hockey has slowly made me fall out of the game, fall out of love with the game over time. And the hockey culture itself of seeing how guys treat each other, seeing how guys treat women, how guys treat people outside of the hockey world, and this level of entitlement, that shit makes me really fall out of love with the game. And I said to her, listen, I love hockey. If I could, I would probably find something to do hockey-wise that doesn't you know, put myself in this culture. But I also love playing the game, and it's a catch-22. So I don't. Well, well the, good, the good news is it's not everybody. It is, a, it is a smaller percentage, and that percentage gets smaller and smaller as the years go by. That's the good news. So I don't want every hockey player or everyone involved in the game to be painted with the same brush because I don't think that's fair. Uh, oh, you're a hockey player. I can pigeonhole you right away. I don't think that's fair. The game is improving. The culture is improving. So I don't, I don't want anyone to give up on it. But nobody's perfect. No industry is perfect. It happens, regardless if it's a sporting industry or you know you're working down at the mill. Things like this happen. We are working on it as a society, and we are filtering out the bad apples. But I, I don't want to paint every hockey player or every athlete, for that matter, with the same brush. I absolutely agreed. And if if this podcast or if you know sharing my vlogs on YouTube can do some good to show people that in 2022. A good attitude, hard work, a little bit of sandpaper personality with a nose down mentality that can get you results. You don't have to be an asshole about things. You don't have to, you know, go be being passive aggressive and you know putting your elbows up. You can get stuff done. You can be respectable. You can be polite and say thank you and have a smile on your face and shake somebody's hand, and look them in the eye at the end of the day. That that still does get results. It, it's a lot of micro wins along the way that add up to a big win, and it takes time. Don't like don't get me wrong. Like what what I love to like not be in the Fed and be playing in the American League or like you know, having a little more success in my career than I have had. Absolutely. But with the hand that I was dealt and what I've been able to accomplish, it's a lot of micro wins along the way and, and you can still get stuff done. You don't have to, you know, feed into this bullshit hockey culture that is, is alive and well. Like you said, it is getting better, but it's got a long, long, long way to go. And I, I don't know if it's going to happen before the time I have kids, which is a scary thought as well. Well, it sound, sounds like someone's heating up the oven. You know what? Let, let's leave off with this last little, uh, little little discussion point before we cap off. I know there's probably like three people listening because we're 45 minutes in, Dave. But when when we rebooted the podcast, uh, you know, three four months ago, and I remember you told me a story early on about how uh, you and your amazing wife Candace, who is a uh, Playboy Bunny model, former Playboy Bunny model, fantastic wife and everything, how you guys met, and within four months from not knowing her, you had moved in within four months. And I remember thinking in my head, hmm. Little, little excessive, maybe clingy, but hey, who am I to judge? You've been married for 10 plus years. You've got two kids. Clearly, it, it worked out. Funny enough, with my girl. Now, I, I met her in Vancouver in, you know, end of August or um, uh, beginning of September. And I'm going to go be seeing her at Christmas time. We're talking about getting a place uh, after the season. Uh, moving in, future, getting a cat. We were talking about getting a big fat cat, like, you know, an orange cat named Pumpkin. Well, she wants to call him Carl. I thought Pumpkin would be a nice name, but I think we might call Carl. You, you got to get over the whole pumpkin spice latte thing. That's really invading your brain lately. It's sugar cookie oat latte season. I'll tell you that right now. And Big Sexy bailed on me today. We're going to go get sugar cookie oat lattes and Big Sexy Bill. That was a little heartbroken. But anyway, uh, we're going to get a, a big fat orange cat. We're talking about all this kind of stuff. And then it's, it clicked into my head the other day. I thought, God damn, I've been spending too much time with Wheeler. <laughs> <laughs> do as I say, not as I do. I am not the I am not the metric for how relationships are supposed to go. Believe me. But funny enough, it, it seems like I'm following in your footsteps in the same path so far, and it uh, it's off to a hot start. And I, like I said, I, I got the most beautiful uh, girl in the world. I even had uh, two of the guys in the last couple of weeks. They they asked me. They said, "Trav, come here. What's up? How did you get the girl that you do?" 
I said, what do you mean? And they're like, look at her and look at you. How did you met? I don't know. Listen, I don't have steal. money and I don't have a big hammer. so You can steal a line from me and I use it all the time when people say, that, like, man, you're batting way out of your league. I said, yeah, I know. Once, once my wife sobers up and gets glasses, I am in big trouble. But while you're sobering up, you can listen to this podcast every Sunday while you decide to sober up. And this podcast is available on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, as we've discussed before. And new episodes drop every Sunday at 11 a.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. in Winnipeg, 9 a.m. in Calgary, 8 a.m. on the West Coast, San Francisco, Vancouver, uh, 3 p.m. in Sweden. No, sorry, 4 p.m. in Sweden, down it all. 3 in the U.K., 5 in Finland, and 11 p.m. in China. My amazing co-host, Dave Wheeler. It is a privilege to do this podcast with you. If you are listening on Spotify, drop us a little review. Give us a little five star. If you're on Apple as well, if you're on the YouTube version, hit the subscribe button, hit the like button. And also, if you like this podcast, maybe you want to throw us a couple bucks. There's a Patreon page as well linked down in the video description. You can throw us a buck. You can throw us five bucks, whatever you want. If it's a goodwill hunting and a good joke, I'm happy to accept that as well. On behalf of Dave Wheeler and myself, thank you for listening to the podcast, and we will see you next week. Dave, take us home here in the final word. Ladies and gentlemen, this guy needs to eat. Send some money on the Patreon.